uh, I've I always uh, have a certain amount of frivolous joyfulness with me. Uh, I, I was that way, I guess, before I got saved. I've always just gotten excited about almost anything. Uh, I remember used to when my, my mother said I could go swimming. Uh, I mean, it was it was the most wonderful thing in the world. I'd get my bathing suit on and my towel in my hand. It was about two miles across town. And, uh, and, and and I just I'd be ready three or four hours before time to go, and finally she'd say, "Okay, oh, you can go," and I'd run all the way, just get there, stand in line, and wait for them to open the gate. I just have always been kind of excited about everything. But I tell you, uh, my wife is here, and I'm so glad to have you, Sue. God bless you, honey. Uh, anybody who uh, who has a wife who stayed with them forty something years. Uh, You, you just have to you have to appreciate somebody like that, brother. And uh, but Sue knows that not only do I have uh, uh, just a lot of highs in my life, I have some pretty deep lows. And today has not been a low. I've been high today, but it has been a day of great sobriety. I have really been sobered. I told Sue, coming over here, I said, uh, I can't wait to see my friends. I can't wait to be with people that I've known since back in the late 60s. Some of the young people that I saw uh, come along and hear them preach their first sermon. I used to, I guess for 20 years, preach youth camps here. Some, and for a few years, three every summer. And I uh, said, I can't wait to get over there and just renew acquaintances uh, if I couldn't die and go to heaven, I'd want to die and go to Milldale. Because uh, I just thoroughly love it here. But I told Sue coming over, I said, God is going to move in at Milldale this week, and before it's over, he's going to change most of us. And uh, I found it to be true. The sermons last night shook me, blessed me, touched me, encouraged me edified me, put me under conviction, and then today it, uh, it moved up another notch. It's like those two little black girls in Sulphur Springs, Texas. I heard singing uh, that song uh, uh, about, uh, I'm going to move up one step higher and uh, so I can walk on the King's Highway. I, I, we moved up another step today. All day long, the sermons have been about holiness and commitment and about being unhypocritical, about being real. And, uh, and, and starting last night, there was an emphasis on the fact that each of us need to be soul winners. We need to be involved in the evangelization of our world. And every message to me has been precept upon precept, and, uh, and, and the apex of the thing is not yet. I don't know what God's going to do tomorrow, what he's going to do tomorrow night, what he's going to do on Monday morning, but if he didn't do anything else, and I really believe that he's not nearly finished, he's already spoken volumes to our hearts, and I think most of us have already come under conviction and I think, uh, like Brother Bill Reddick, most of us have already made some vows before the Lord and some new commitments unto Him. And I want you to take your Bible, if you will, and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I guess uh, that uh, the main thing that I wanted to tell you in, in this way of introduction was that uh, I just uh, really have a, a sobriety upon me. I feel like that I've been baptized with a sense of of earnestness and seriousness, and that though there always is the joy of the Lord that is our strength, I think there are times when it does us good to just be sober before the Lord and let Him do a deep work in our hearts. And I love the line that Brother Bill had that I'm going to use from now on as long as I have a memory why I can remember it. He said, the definition of being a deeper Christian is find you a verse and just do it. 
<laughs> That's a great definition of the deep, spirit-filled life. Read your verse and just do what it says. I mean, that's, the, that's it right there. That's the definition. In the book of 1 Timothy, Paul is writing to his son in the ministry. And, 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 and he's in the Mamertine prison, best I understand. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a time of difficulty for him. And yet he's really trying to encourage this young minister of the faith. And he says a number of things to him. He said, uh, one thing that's going on, Timothy, that you recognize is that there are a lot of fables going around. And you know who the author of fables are. It's the devil. Satan is the author of fables. And when I hear about the kind of preaching that's going on, it seems like that these preachers are taking disconnected facts and, and useless or endless genealogies, and, and, and their preaching is producing more questions and more doubts than, than hope and faith that's being in, in enlightening people. These disconnect, uh, disconnected ideas are, are producing confusion in the hearts of the people. He says there in chapter 1 and verse 4, rather than godly edifying. Our preaching ought to always uh, uh, be godly edifying, edifying people toward godliness. But he said, that's not the kind of preaching that's going on. And he exhorted him to uh, minister in the gift that the Lord had given him. And he said, uh, this is no time for a novice. Over in chapter 3 and verse 6, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall uh, into the condemnation of the devil. He's talking about leaders in the church. He's talking about uh, this young minister. He said, let no man despise thy youth, but don't be a novice. In the Christian world, you need to grow up quick. And there's never been a time when young people need to grow up quicker. Uh, you need to grow up quick, young person. You need to grow up in the Lord quickly. Because you need to be on the fine line. These young men like Jonathan, uh, Brother Jimmy's grandson, and others who have been over there in, uh, in Iraq, they, they've had to grow up quick. A couple of his other grandchildren are going in the military. And they'll grow up quick. Well, we're in the Lord's army. And it's time to grow up quick. We need some of you young people. Don't, don't, don't play around. Uh, don't waste your youth. Let no man despise thy youth, but don't remain a novice. Get in this business and let's get busy uh, on the fine line for the Lord. Amen? And he says uh, in verse 5, he speaks of love, charity. He speaks of a pure heart. He speaks of a good conscience. He speaks of an unfeigned or an unhypocritical faith. Uh, down in verse 9, he begins talking about the fact that, uh, that we know that the, 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 the teaching of the law simply reveals uh, that which is in the heart of man. And he thinks of himself, he thinks of others, and he, he speaks of lawlessness and disobedience. He speaks of the ungodly. He speaks of sinners, the unholy, the profane, uh, the murderers of fathers and the murderers of mothers and manslayers. In verse 10, he speaks of whoremongers. He speaks of those who defile themselves with mankind, men stealers, liars, uh, perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine. He's, of course, saying that we don't need this in the church, but he's also saying... Remember, as he did over in the book of Titus, we also had our conversation with this kind of life. This was our kind of life back before we were saved. We had our part in that kind of living because he says in verse 11, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, uh, for that he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was... And he could go back and reiterate all these other sins, this lawlessness and profanity and murderers and all these things. But he simply says, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, and I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But then he says in verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He says to him, above all other things, I was a sinner, and I was a chief of sinners, but God has saved me, and he saved me by the man Jesus Christ. He saved me by this glorious gospel message that he's committed unto me and that he's committed unto you. 
And then when he thinks about his own wonderful salvation, he gets in a, in a high mood and he says in verse 17, And now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, and the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that, the, that, that thou by them be a mightiest war, a good war. The mightiest war, a good warfare. He says, Timothy, you're young, but I'm telling you, we're in a warfare, son. No time for you to be a novice. No time for you to back out and take time to play. You're in a warfare. You're thrust into the battle. And it's hot, it's heavy, and it's mean, it's evil, it's ugly, it's bloody, and it's for keeps. And then he, in verses 19 and 20, he talks about how important it is to hold forth uh, the faith in a good conscience because some people have got, gotten shipwrecked. And he, then he mentions a couple of fellows, and it's an amazing thing. He said, I turned them over to Satan that they might learn not to blaspheme. Now here was a man who knew spiritual warfare. He walked in spiritual authority. I knew nothing about demons. As a matter of fact, my professor in the university where I attended a Christian university uh, said there were no such thing as demons and he didn't even believe in a personal devil. I'd, I'd come to believe in demons and recognize their existence and I knew nothing about them until in 1966 I went to the mission field down in Brazil and I saw demonic activity and I saw people converted out of witchcraft. And I saw witches perform miracles before my eyes. I saw a witch reach up and touch a man's gorder, and a woman's gorder, and it disappeared. A big gorder about like a softball just disappeared. Demon power. I had an old missionary named Hal Renfro sit me down and said, I want to give you a lesson. And he began to tell me about instances of dealing with the devil. I was sitting there uh, uh, getting ready for a radio program on, uh, down in Brazil, and, and I had a translator, Walter Cascio, my friend, and another man walked up, a little handsome little young fellow about like this, about this tall, and uh, well-dressed, and he said, I'm so-and-so, and I'm the head of the Yazoo School of English, and I'm going to be a translator. I said, well, I ought to have a translator. He said, no, I sponsor this program, and I'm going to be your translator. And so it was a home economics program. They'd ask her, this home economics professor. And, and she had opened up the mic and I preached and, and then she opened it up for questions and it went from one hour to two hours and, and they began to ask things about the Lord and I began to answer them and, and this fellow was having to translate. And so he's talking about the blood, he's talking about Jesus, he's talking about the Messiah, he's talking about the resurrection, talking about the cross, and all these other things. And man, I looked over there and big old beads of sweat was popping out. And when I was telling people how to be saved and led a couple to the Lord over the telephone or on the radio there, uh, he was, man, he was really sweating. Well, after he left, I learned who he was. He was the head of a spiritualist church in that area, a whole region of Brazil. He was the witch doctor. And, and, and they began to, one man began to tell me about the orgies they would have when he was the leader. They'd come into this Satan churches and they'd have uh, some of the Catholic saints and some of the saints and other pagans and, and then they would have this little statue of the devil down under the communion table and they would kill animals and have a communion with the blood of the animals. And then they would get down on their stomachs naked and they would uh, drink all this uh, uh, dope and everything, this pharmacia. And they would go into these sexual organs worshiping the devil. That's who this fellow was. Well, I'm telling you, I saw him one night out in the audience. I was up on the back of a truck preaching and I saw him out in the crowd. He suddenly disappeared. I went to another radio station about a week later uh, for another program, and the same guy shows up in his same suit. He came up to me and said, well, I'm back. I've sponsored this program. And uh, he said, uh, I'm going to be a translator. I said, no, uh, you can't be the translator. You see, I found out who you are. He said, well, I don't care what you say. If you're going to get your message out, 
He had smiled. He said, "Gonna get your message out. The only way you're gonna do it's through me." And I said, "Well, can my translator correct you if you mix up?" He said, "Yes, surely can." So I sat down there and I said, "I represent the greatest power on earth." And of course, they saw that so much military power of America. I said, "I represent the greatest government on earth." Some of them begin to shake the fist. And I said, the greatest power is the power of the resurrection, and the greatest government is Jesus governing in the lives of men. And I lit in and preached the gospel message. And when I got through, I said to this young man, I said, sir, I want to talk to you because uh, I, I have found out who you are and that you're a devil worshiper. He said, I want to tell you something you need to know. I said, what's that? He said, when you started preaching today, I was that close to being saved. I was under conviction. That's why I came back. And he said, I want you to know why you're preaching. I don't let Jesus Christ in my heart, and he is my Lord and my Savior, and I'm now a born-again Christian, and if you want me to, I'll go and we'll do us another program, and I'll tell them how I got saved. And I saw the power of God to break the bondage of the devil. Amen? That old boy got born again. Well, I want to speak tonight out of the first eight verses of, of 1 Timothy chapter 2, so let's read it together. And, and it'd probably be good for you to stand simply to stretch and honor the Word of God. Paul said on the basis of the fact of everything I'm telling you, Timothy, and the fact that I was saved and, and that the whole pagan world needs to be saved and that God has committed to us such a wonderful gospel, he said, I exhort therefore... You know, it continues the thought, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now you think about that. All men. Let's just stop a moment. And this, is, this is sobering stuff right here. A sovereign God of the universe in his great scheme of things has given you the power of influence over unknown people in the regions beyond because through prayer you can move them toward salvation and with the gospel they can be saved. He said giving thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray in these next few moments, you shall continue what you've begun doing through this day and what you'd already started before we got to this camp meeting. And God, bring it to the conclusion that you want to uh, bring it to tonight and to build upon what will happen the days ahead if you tarry your coming. We thank you for the Bible, God's holy word, in Jesus' name, amen. My subject tonight is the urgent call of world evangelization. Now this passage is a passage that has to do with world evangelization. First of all, Timothy said that if we're going to be involved in reaching the peoples of the world with the gospel, if we're going to fulfill the Great Commission, then there needs to be unceasing prayer. He says, I exhort therefore, uh, first of all, and he begins to speak about different ways of praying, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks, and it be made for all. First of all, I want to point out that the Lord says that we should unceasingly be praying for all men everywhere that they may hear the truth and be saved. You say, man, that's a big order. 
that we pray for all men everywhere that they might be saved. That's what the exhortation is from the Apostle Paul, which came from the Holy Spirit, which is the very heart of God. The exhortation is that we pray for men everywhere, all men everywhere, that they might hear the truth and be saved. First of all, we see the priority of prayer. He says, I exhort that therefore, first of all, first of all, the priority is that we pray. Spurgeon said, all the Christian virtues are locked up in the word prayer. Someone said, our, our potential is almost uh, uh, unlimited uh, after we pray, but before we pray, even the best of us are disabled or dis disqualified, defeated, and disenfranchised. So we must pray, and the arch enemy of the soul of mankind is Satan, and the arch enemy of world evangelization is Satan, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the devil. This is a spiritual warfare, and so this giant of God who hazarded his life for the gospel's sake, who went out preaching, and who was in prison and shipwrecked and beaten, and who confronted the devil and the demons at every point, and who was blessed of God in mighty power, this old prayer warrior, this old warrior of God, this old saint that knew how to do warfare said, the first priority is that we pray. It's usually about the last thing that we get around to. We make all of our plans and, and get everything all done, raise the money, everything we do, and say, well, now let's have a little prayer to bless it. He said the first priority is that we pray. You see, we're facing the cunning soldiers of Satan, the emissaries of a hierarchy that is unseen. They're cunning and they're violent and they are, they are out to seduce and to deceive. They're out to terrorize and they're out to damn the souls of mankind. And no wonder, no wonder, Paul said, you need to begin on your knees in humility with a total dependency upon God. This thing is bigger than we are. This thing of world evangelization, this thing of sharing the gospel to the ends of the earth is not something that you're going to be able to handle. It must be done in the power of God. It's a spiritual warfare. And so he said, there's a priority in prayer. And then... Because of that priority, there's the plea for prayer. He says, I exhort, therefore, first of all. The word exhort means to urge out of your innermost being. Paul was saying, I urge you out of the most, my innermost being. Listen, boy. Listen, Timothy. I'm trying to help you, son. This thing is a spiritual warfare. So I plead with you to make prayer your first priority. And then there's the purpose of prayer. Now, of course, I'm not talking about the all-inclusive purpose of prayer, but the purpose that Paul had in mind here, here is the purpose of prayer, that all men might hear the truth and be saved. That's the prayer, he said, I'm talking about. That's the purpose, that all men hear the truth and be saved in verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Now that is either will. You believe that's the will of God? Do you believe that's the word of God? Does it say who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth? Did somebody miss something there? That's the prayer that we ought to be praying. That's the purpose of the prayer. And of course, along with that prayer, we ought to pray the prayer that Jesus encouraged us to pray. In Matthew 9, 38, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. Also, he said, pray for leaders, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life and all godliness and honesty. Now, the picture that normally we get is this. Here we are, God's little choice, precious people, wonderful as we are, and I'll tell you what, the old booger bears right there in the world, and they just are very aggressive, 
And we need to pray so that we can just live in peace and we can be at ease inside and we can just enjoy the fullness of the Holy Ghost and we can enjoy all the fruits of the Spirit and we can just put more, more ornaments on the on the Christmas tree and we can do the hippity thop and the back flop and walk on the back of the pews and praise the Lord and talk in tongues and jitter jatter and do this, that, and the other and everything that matters and we can just get together and have a fun. And oh, meanie, meanie, meanie devil, you need to let us on. We need to live a quiet and peaceful life. Let us alone. But I tell you in the scripture, God never pictures his believers as a bunch of pacifists. He pictures us as being on the aggressive, as being on the march, as being on the offensive. And he said, therefore, you need to pray for the leaders and hear what I think he means. I says, I think he says, you need to pray for the leaders so that the conditions will be conducive to the spread of the gospel. That's why you need to pray for the leaders. Not so your taxes can be lowered, and not this, that, and other, but you need to pray for the leaders so that they won't interfere and mess around with us when we're trying to preach the gospel. You see, if we're going to walk in honesty and in dignity, and if we're going to be able to carry out the Great Commission and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth, the evil powers must be quieted because as we come against these unseen hierarchies, our prayer is our only weapon and our intercession is the only way of tearing down the strongholds when they're trying to spoil what we're trying to do. You, you know this passage uh, so familiarly, but Ephesians uh, says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Philip, I think, used that message today. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And, and what that literally means, we do not wrestle against people who are made of flesh and blood, but we wrestle against an enemy that is spiritual and they're evil, and they're unseen, and they're well organized in a hierarchy, I'm convinced that there's a head demon over Shreveport and over Baton Rouge and over the state, maybe. The devil's well organized. He has a hierarchy of demons all around. And Brother Manley said he has at least one head demon in every church, and most of the time he lives in a woman. I didn't say that. Brother Manley said that. But don't you think there aren't demons assigned to every church? And demons assigned to tear down the pastor. And so we're to come against them. Because the, the, the power of the devil is strong. Look in, in, in uh, 2 Corinthians. Good, good verses to use here, good truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 4 and 5 says... For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is, they're not of the flesh, but mighty. Through God, how are they made mighty? Because they're through God in the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What we need more than anything else are prayer warriors that will come against the Harry Potter philosophy and the pornography philosophy and, and, the, and the demons and the powers that are in this world today. The strategies and the, and, and the, and the tricks of the devil are under the domain of evil rulers and authorities in an unseen world. They have mighty powers of darkness to rule this world. Uh, they're wicked, and we come against these wicked spirits in heavenly places. And ladies and gentlemen, you may identify human beings with them, but you cannot give them a human name. These evil powers that we have to come against in prayer are not named Bin Laden. They're not named Hussein. They're not named Gaddafi. Years ago, they were not named Hitler or Mussolini. They are demons with great power under the power of the devil who is anti-Christ and anti-God and who's come into this world to destroy all of humanity. 
We don't wrestle against mere flesh and blood. Christian Weiss, a great statesman in the world of missions, said, Christians are to pray that people will be delivered from the power of darkness and sin, that they may come to the true knowledge of Jesus Christ through God's Word, and that the rulers of the world will not do things that could throw the world into jeopardy. Pray for peace and freedom to go on with the task of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the earth is a fundamental element of truth of the Christian doctrine and an experience. I believe with all of my heart that we need to be praying for the lost of the world. Maybe a new thought to some of us, but I tell you, we're, we're not doing it. I've never been taught that, really. I was reading this passage and God just slapped me around. I've always heard, don't pray generally. And don't pray for Africa or don't pray for the sinners of the world. Call them by name. But he says here, pray for all men. How are you going to pray for all the millions of the world? Call all of them by name. You ought to call the ones you can. But they, I believe that God is challenging us and may God, may we heed the call here at Milldale to start praying for the lost of the world. And for leaders around the world, pick them out by name. Find the names in a paper or whatever you can. If you don't know the names, it doesn't matter. There's a demon in charge. And cast them down. Loose them and bind them in the blood of Jesus and in the authority of God. And cast them down so they won't interfere when we go over there to preach the gospel, Brother Sonny. That's why Paul said, pray for me that the effectual door stay open. And I can go through Let me ask you, who are you praying for? Praying for the sick, the elderly, the needy? But let's start praying for the world, the peoples of the world, that they'll hear the truth and be saved. There'll be a free course of the gospel. They've got to send forth labors into the field. I was in First Baptist Church, Dade City, Florida, and they asked me to come out and speak a word in one of, in the largest Sunday school class, an older adult Sunday school class. And I timed it. They spent 37 minutes taking prayer requests for the sick and afflicted. During that time, they didn't ask us to pray for one lost soul. And I tell you, it grieves my heart. It grieves the heart of God. Oh, it doesn't grieve the heart of God that we pray for the sick, but it grieves uh, God's heart that we're not praying for the lost. Because I think we ought to pray for many of them by name. You ought to have a prayer list. Time and time and time again, I've had old saints of God show me their prayer list where they prayed for people as long as 47 years. One lady prayed for 47 years. She'd been praying 47 years when the 37th person on the list got saved. I've had people tell me that they prayed for people on a list and maybe had 50 on the list and that in their lifetime they got to see every one of them saved. There's great power, soul winning power, in prayer. Brother Manley wrote a book years ago about praying for the lost. I wish I could find a copy of that. Praying for the lost. We got a lot of people to pray for, haven't we? At the time of King David, about 1000 BC, there were approximately 150 million people on the earth. By the time that Christ uh, came, it had doubled to about 300 million. Due to wars and plagues and the population increased over the next uh, 1,500 years. But by the 1600s, when the pilgrims emerged in the New World, there were about 500 million people on the planet, about a half a billion. By 1750, as the uh, rev uh, evolution of uh, the revolution in the, the uh, industrial revolution in Britain began to take place, the world population could have been as high as 800 million people. The world didn't reach one billion till the year 1800. By 1930, it was two billion. By 1960, three billion. By 1974, four billion. By 1999, six billion. It's almost seven billion now. They, they forecast in the Encyclopedia Botanica about four or five years ago that by the year 20... 25, the world's population will be 7.8 billion. I believe it's going to be more than that now. And by the year 2050, if the Lord tears is coming, almost 10 billion people. 
According to the Population Reference Bureau, every minute 101 people die in the world, but at the same time, 261 people are born. We better get busy. And we better be praying, and we better get together. And we better work in coalitions and put ourselves together and work together. A lot of you churches ought to make up your mind that you're going to go with Brother Sonny. You're going to go with Brother Bill Britt. You're going to go with some of our other ministries. Brother Bill Britt saw over 11,000 people saved overseas last year. Not counting the what he saw here. I don't know how many Brother Sonny, thousands Brother Sonny saw saved down in Nicaragua and other places. I, uh, we just got back from Africa where 10,000 people gave their heart to Christ. 2,000 in the Philippines early in the year. It can be done. Some of you are doing it where you are. Your churches are doing it. You're working together uh, in cooperation. But I tell you, we, it's a big task. It's like uh, this one boy said, I got an idea for in World War I. said, I'll tell you what, we've got to whip them Germans over there in, in, in overseas. And I'll, I'll make a suggestion that everybody get their shotgun and everybody get their rifle and their ammunition. You get their rowboat and let's all take off. That wasn't way to do it. They came together and organized and bought each other guns and rifles and put each other on the boat and they organized and won the war. And, and we've got to get together. As we look at this task of winning all these billions of people to the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we, we say, well, man, we've got to get busy. But sometimes Satan laughs at our toiling, mocks our wisdom, but I tell you, always trembles at our prayers. And I know the carnal mind rebels against uh, uh, participating in world evangelism uh, through our prayer. You say, it's, it's too overwhelming. Uh, what, what difference will my little old praying make? Or I don't know how to pray for everybody in the world. Well, we just need to stop making excuses and just get up every day. And after we've gotten ourselves right with God and praised the Lord and glorified and had a fellowship with Him and gone through this worship time, our private worship time with the Lord, we need to start praying for the lost of the world and praying for the leaders of the world that, that they would give us peace so we can go with the gospel in Vietnam and in Colombia and wherever we want to go with the gospel. That, that even the Muslims can't interfere. Who do you think's in charge of all that much? It's a devil. Had Jesus had power over the devil. Let's pray for the free course of the gospel. Hear the Apostle Paul in verse 8. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, without doubting. Let me read that again. I will therefore, this is uh, his will, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Like Paul had holy hands. It said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26, Paul said, I am pure from the blood of all men. I tell you, we need to be witnessing where we are. And we're going to pray for the lost of the world. Amen? We need to have pure hands. And without wrath, that is like Jonah. See, Jonah said, God, that bunch of Nineveh ain't worth a nickel anyway. Don't save them. Send all of them to hell. We want to just tell all the Muslims to go to hell. He said, pray without wrath. And pray without counting. Just pray believing that God is going to open the world. And we're going to go everywhere with the gospel. And folks from every nation and tribe are going to come to Jesus and be born again. Woo! My Lord Jesus, i got three more points. You know most of this stuff anyway, but I want to tell you quickly. In this passage, we have not only, as a part of world evangelization, the unceasing prayer, but the uniqueness of Christ. He says there's one God, one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus. See, that's not any other message for the world. There is no hope outside of Jesus. 
I was asked to come to the big Muraman convention in India where they have 100,000 people and sometimes more gather on a riverbed that's dried up. And I'd always uh, hope the Lord would give me that opportunity. And the old bishop over there invited me to come and preach and I gave me a special visa. And I was so excited when I got there uh, to preach at that big convention. I met with all the people and sitting across from me having a meal was a woman who worked for the uh, World Council of Churches. She didn't believe in a personal salvation. She didn't believe in the devil. She didn't believe in anything. So I got in an argument with her, and, 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 and she told me what she was going to speak on, and I said, I'm going to get up and refute everything you said. And so the old bishop said, we don't want any trouble, and they sent me home and wouldn't let me preach. I should have prayed more. We should have broken down that stronghold before I got there. Because, see, the devil had it set up. That's not but one Savior. One God in the universe. He is Jehovah, Yahweh, Elohim, El Shaddai, Adonai, not these others. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Moses, oh, here, oh, Israel, the Lord our God is one God. Look unto me and be all, all ye and be saved, all ye ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. One mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mediator means one who stands in the middle between two parties for the purpose of effecting oneness, harmony, reconciliation. Job said, oh, that there were a daysman who could stand in the gap and take God by one hand and mankind by the other hand and bring them together. And then Job saw it and said, oh, I know that my Redeemer liveth and I'm going to stand with him one day. Yes, there is a Savior and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the appointed one, the only Savior that the world needs to know. And let me give you these scriptures in case you've forgotten. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except he come by me. Acts 4, 12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 1 John 5, 11, 12, and this is a record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And as someone has already said, Buddha and Mohammed and all this other crowd cannot say, save, and secularism cannot save, humanism cannot save, education cannot save, money cannot save. There's only one way to be saved, and that is by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The evangelist has a pure message, Jesus Christ. Adonai Judson lived from 1788 to 1850 when he was in Burma as a missionary about to starve, having a hard time. The British government came to him and offered him a position of prestige and power and wealth. It would have made him a wealthy, powerful man. And they said, you can still do your missionary work. He thought about it and he said to them in response, I feel a strong desire henceforth to know nothing among this people but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And under an abiding a sense of a comparative worthlessness of all worldly things, to avoid every secular occupation and all literary and scientific pursuits, and devote the remainder of my days to the simple declaration of the all-precious truth of the gospel of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I determined to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Let me quickly share with you another thing. In verse 6 it says, 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave himself a ransom for all. I want to speak for just a moment on unlimited atonement. The Bible says he gave himself a ransom for all. He just got through telling us to pray for all the people of the world that they can hear the truth and be saved. And now he says he died a ransom for all. Ransom means to buy back. 
It means he paid the sacrificial debt the, instead of, in place of, in behalf of, in order he might redeem sinners. Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. 1 John 2, 2. He is the perpetuation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the world. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you unto the end of the world. And Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Revelation 22, 17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hears say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. First Timothy 2, 4 again, who will have all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of truth. I'll tell you, when I go and face one of them little Africans, manager of the hotel made $15 a month. If a preacher could make $100 a month, he could live pretty high. They're standard. Poor people. God, make way for the man of God. Here comes a man of God with the Word of God. Now, I want you to know I'd have felt like a nut to get up there and say, I'd like to offer salvation to all of you. But I'm not sure Jesus died for all of you. I'm not sure he shed his blood for some of you. So, it's just kind of a Pig in the poke lottery. Y'all won't try this thing, try it, but I ain't sure he shed his blood for you. Y'all do what you want to. But I tell every one of them, God loves you. Jesus died on the cross for you. And he shed his blood for you. And whosoever believeth, be saved. The last thing he said, there's the urgency of witnessing. He said to be testified in due time. You know when the due time is now? It's now. I mean, the, the, uh, everything that the Lord has done needs a testimony. And Paul said, I've been anointed to give a testimony, to proclaim and you and I, ladies and gentlemen, we have the urgency of witnessing. I heard a man say one day years ago uh, in, a, in a convention in Gatlinburg, he said, if God has not told you to stay at home in Jerusalem, or he hadn't told you not to go any further than your Judea or Samaria, then you're automatically called to go to the end of the world. Do you have a burden for the million people live in a billion people live in China who have a soul that'll burn in hell if they don't get saved? Do you have a burden for the billion people who live in India? Do you have a burden for the people down in Nicaragua and El Salvador and down yonder in Guatemala and Costa Rica and Honduras and Haiti and Jamaica? Do you have a burden for the people in Brazil and, and all around the world? Are you willing to go? Are you willing to give your money to help others go? Are you willing to pray for them? 
let the Scripture speak. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We then as workers together with him beseech you, you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time acceptable, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When is the due time? Now. We need to do like the awakened, broken, contrite, surrendered Isaiah and say, Hear him, my Lord, send me. Let me close to this. You have on your pew belt. And God give us the grace to think, and to think soberly. In their classes of the history of missions, Yvonne Woods of the U.S. Center for World Missions described what she calls the greatest, biggest loss of opportunity in missionary history. There was a 13-year-old boy in Mongolia who inherited a bit of land from his father. The boy was a precocious warrior with instinctive brilliance as a military strategist. He was also ruthless, and he formed fighting bands that went from village to village until he was ruling over two million people in, Mon in a Mongolian empire that stretched from China to India and from Siberia to the edges of Western Europe. And this young man was given the title Genghis Khan. He ruled more territory than any other man in history has ever ruled. Meanwhile, at the same time, in Western Europe, a great revival was occurring under the preaching of St. Francis of Assisi, and thousands of were becoming Christians. And following Khan's death, the bulk of his empire eventually went to his grandson, Kublai Khan, who established his capital city in Beijing, China. He had two Italians visit his court named Polo, the father and the uncle of the famed Marco Polo. They began to tell Kublai Khan about Christ and Christianity. And the great ruler became very interested. He sent the Polo brothers back with their quest for 100 missionaries to tell the Mongolians and the Chinese about Christianity. He said, when we learn about Christianity... There will be more Christians in my empire than in all of Europe. The Polos returned, but no one was interested in going as a missionary. Finally, two old friars started the journey, but halfway chickened out and turned back. Later on, Marco Polo accompanied his relatives there. And when they got back, Kublai Khan said, Where are the missionaries? When are they coming? They said, No one came. Eventually, they did send a few, but the opportunity had passed. Can you imagine how different the world would be if we'd gone. Can you think about how different the world would be if we'd sent the missionaries MacArthur requested to Japan? Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. 
Say not there yet four months and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look unto the fields. They're white already under harvest. I close with a broken heart. Brother, son, I, I can't hardly stand it. Can you? I can't hardly stand it. I talked to a church the other day that just voted to build a $10 million recreational family life center. Ten million. Time to pay interest to be a fifteen million at least. My estimation is they I don't even baptize a hundred a year now. They won't increase their baptisms ten a year with all that money. Or if they just cut that building down in half and make it not quite so ornamental. Me and Sonny could take half of it. Win four or five million people to Christ. Son, these are the last days. And while the doors are open, we gotta go. We gotta go. The doors are open wide down in Nicaragua to Sunny. Somebody's been praying. The leadership has almost fallen at Sonny's feet, begging him to come. Same thing's happened to me in Costa Rica. Folks, we've got to go. We've got to give. And here's my last thought. The church was on the march. The New Testament pattern of evangelism for world evangelization had begun. People were going with the gospel. Jesus said, Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That doesn't mean, as, as I said earlier, the church is in a huddle and the devil's trying to get us and we're trying to protect ourselves. No, sir, we're on the aggressive. We're out going with the gospel. Remember in chapter 5 of the book of Acts, when Ananias and Sapphira sold some land and they lied about how much it was, and first God killed Ananias, then God killed Sapphira. Why do you think that was such a serious matter with God? Was it because they wasn't going to have that money to feed the Christians who were impoverished so they could keep the little bands going? No! That early church was engaged in world evangelization they were on the march. And these two people dared stand in the way of the march of the gospel. And God killed them and said, I'm serious about world evangelization.